Welcome to Gross Anatomy. Hi, Lauren Taylor. Hi, Dr. Cohen. How are you? I am well. Are we live at Gross Anatomy? We are live with Gross Anatomy Podcast. Where, what are we talking about today? Today we are talking about one of my favorite things that we do on the show. And kind of one of the reasons we started the show was to review medical shows, usually scripted medical shows, some reality, but mostly scripted medical shows. On this episode, we are reviewing This Is Going to Hurt, which is a BBC AMC seven episode series. Yes. And it was based on a book. It's based on a book. You told me that. I didn't know that. I looked into it. Uh, it's based on a book by a 42-year-old doctor, or I guess former doctor, he no longer practices, Adam Kay. Cool. Are you familiar? Were you familiar with his work? Yeah. So way back when, when you texted, when you emailed me about, let's let's talk about this show, I saw just looked up the email, the research you had done. But then I was in the airport, and I one of my favorite things to do when I'm in the, the airport is to go to the bookstore magazine section and just look. I love going to bookstores. I love looking at books. So I saw that book and I picked it up and flipped through it a bit and almost bought it. And then angrily, I did it. <laughs> is it because you're jealous of this doctor? Totally, totally. <laughs> How, you, you totally know me by now. That's exactly the reason why. I mean, I'm jealous of him, too. He's a doctor, and he, now he's like he's written a lot of shows. A B- London Times bestselling book. I don't know if it was a bestselling book in America. I just read that it was a London Times bestselling book. And he's only 42 years old, so I'm jealous, too. Right. He's 10 years younger than I am, and he's already doing one of the things that's on my list. So I hate him. Yeah. I guess he was an OBGYN. I guess the show is based on his life. I, I couldn't know. tell. I started reading the book, and I couldn't. It wasn't very clear, at least in the beginning of the book, that he was doing OBGYN. It was just that he was a tired guy, kind of already burnt out from the start. Right. So, yeah, that's what I don't know for sure. The, sh- the show, This Is Going to Hurt, follows, and what do you call him, just an OBGYN? A what is the title? What's the proper title? Yeah, an obstetrician gynecologist or an OBGYN. And, and I don't know the British system, so I don't know if he was still a resident. My guess is it sounded like he was like the equivalent of a senior chief resident or maybe a fellow. Um, but I, I could or a young, I, I'm not sure if he was already fully trained and now a young attending. I, I couldn't really necessarily tell that. Yeah. So the show starts where you see the actor Ben Wishaw, who I think our audience would probably know him most famously as like he played Q in the James Bond movies. Oh, I was trying to place him. I knew him, but I didn't realize that that's what he was famous for. Exactly. Yeah, he's been in a lot of stuff. So they follow that doctor. He's asleep in his car. So I feel like right away it starts with one of the tropes. Doctors are always tired, like always in every show and every everything we watch with them. Right. And I, and I like the way he thought that he was in an accident. <laughs> yeah. He didn't know where he was because he's so tired after his shift. He just falls asleep in his car. Right. And he never made it home that night. And he had no clue where he was. I, I like that a lot. In fact, it reminded me of one time I was coming home after doing a shift in general surgery. And I was driving home. I was in Brooklyn driving home. And I was stopped at a light. And the next thing I know, someone's banging on my window. Because what happened was, is I fell asleep at the light and slowly rolled into the person in front of me and kind of just gave him a little boom. And then that person got out of their car, making sure I was not angry or anything, just really wanting to make sure I was okay. And uh, yeah. Wow. So that, so it's not, it's a trope because it's a, it's a real thing that happens. You guys are so tired at the end of your shift, which begs the question, why do they have 12 hour shifts? Is it just because the patient needs that doctor for the 12 hours? Like, do you think they should change that? I I think a lot of it has been changed. I I don't know if for the most part, it really is as brutal as it used to be, but there is still a certain amount of sleep deprivation and and working hard, but I'm old fashioned. So I, I, people, I'm going to get hate for this, but I kind of think it's a way of, of making people rise to be their best and, deliberately putting people under stress a little bit because unfortunately most 
of the time, a lot of medical professions, you do, you're under stress and you need to be able to, to work under stress. So, you know, I, I think there's something to, to it a little bit. Right. Well, no, I mean, I don't know why you would get hate for that. It's your opinion. You've been through it. You've been through the system. So I think you, you, uh, you've earned the right to have your opinion on that. Thank you, Lauren. I appreciate, I wish everyone were like you, but, but I think some people think, oh, I'm old fashioned, you know, how, how dare you think that doing that's okay. You know, it puts people at risk, you know, all the, there's always an argument for, for, there's always three sides to everything. So, right. and I understand that side too, but I think, you know, my analogy, the thing I always say is I, I always talk about both the military or I talk about like pro athletes, the pro athletes get to be pro athletes because they live and breathe that sport all the time. And so that, at, you know, when it's the end of a game and they're down by a few points, you want that pro athlete in the game, not sitting out on the bench resting because they they trained their whole life for that. And and same thing with the military. Part of why the military training is so brutal is because you can't predict what's going to happen. It's not like, OK, let's have a battle from nine to 11 this morning and then relax and have tea. It, do, it doesn't work that way. And I think, unfortunately, or the reality of medicine is you're always going to be thrown curveballs. It doesn't matter what time it's going to be. And and if you're if you've been up and seen it and and dealt with it, especially under stress, hopefully when it happens to you later on, you're going to, you know, handle it easily. I mean, that makes perfect sense to me, because when you when they were like the main character was going into the show, it did kind of seem like a, a battlefield. It's um. He's I I don't know where exactly the show is supposed to be. It was, I'm guessing somewhere in London, but it's like the national it's the NHS. So the National Health Service. So it's like the publicly funded hospital in the UK. And it's just it seems very chaotic and like you would need to be able to handle chaos. Well, totally. And I don't know what year it's supposed to be, if it's supposed to be current day or 10 years ago. That That's the only thing I couldn't really tell. Could you? Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember if the episode said, but I he started in 2004. So I just assumed it was like supposed to be around that time. I guess it doesn't matter that much. Right. Although, you know, things have improved over that's the last that's, that's 20 years, practically. So things have gotten better. That's true. That's a good point. Yeah. So, yes. So he's starting his shift and he kind of breaks the fourth wall, which I didn't mind. Um, it was like, no, I liked it. You, yeah, you liked it. Yeah, it's like. It's, I feel like a lot of more shows and movies are doing that now because Phoebe Waller-Bridge made it famous in Fleabag. I don't know if you watch that show, Fleabag. I saw one episode where she's having sex and turns and talks to us. <laughs> it's a good show, but um, I've seen it done really poorly, but I think this show did it well. Yeah, almost like Ferris Bueller a little bit. It kind of felt Ferris Bueller-esque. That's true. Yeah. And so, yeah, I like this character. I just watched the first episode. You watched a little bit more than me. I, think. I watched. Yeah, I wanted to see a little bit more. I, I watched it drop more uh, just because I could. And uh, yeah, I think it's interesting. I think it's, you know, another medical show, though. Right. It is another medical show. But here, I have a few questions for you. What do you got? So one of his first patients, she's having a baby. She doesn't want to work with the black nurse. The white nurse had just finished like a 15 hour shift. And she was like, I'm going home. She was like, can you stay? She didn't want to work with a black nurse. So the doctor was, you know, obviously pissed off and he was like, you, you know, you can work with her, you can leave. My question for you is, it, have you ever had a racist patient that you've had to talk to or maybe someone that, you know, was racist against you? You know, I, I don't, I, I don't, at least not to my knowledge. And I may just be totally naive, but I, as stupid as it sounds, I really try to turn race off for the most part in my brain when I'm taking care of people. I mean, yeah, you know, so I think they're bad people and then they're good people. And I think it is, it doesn't. So I've seen crappy people and I've seen crappy people be crappy, but luckily I, I haven't necessarily seen, but I'm sure there's a ton of it, but I, I personally haven't felt or seen racism per se. I mean, you hear stupid snide comments, uh, but not not necessarily per se. I, I really haven't. And 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 I don't know if I had if I would be that brave and brazen how he was and bold. I, I, I wish I would be that brave and bold and and 
I mean, that was amazing how brave he is. But I, I think people are only that brave if they're stupid, lucky, or on TV. Right. And he did get reprimanded for that, for his the way that he talked to that patient, even though she was a racist. Right. But I, I wish I had had the guts to do yeah. that, too. But I don't I don't know if I would, especially in that kind of situation where you're the doctor. Like, yeah. I find I eat crap much more often from mean, abusive patients just because they're mean, mean and abusive, just trying to take care of them. So I, I often have felt to myself, God, I wish I just said to that patient who's mean and abusive, bye, you know, kind of yeah. thing, go away. Rarely, if someone's not nice to my staff, I I may try to say something. You know, I'll I'll say, listen, that that that's not okay, right. and, I, and I think you need to apologize to my staff. I I have done that. It's not for racist stuff. It's just for people being mean and and mm-hmm. nasty. Sometimes they are, but I often try, not always, when that happens to, and I and I don't. I think being racist is not okay, but I think mean and nasty, I think often maybe there's something else going on and I'll try to figure out if I, you know, that's kind of the fun of it for me to see if I could figure out how to make them not mean and nasty anymore, because that's part of their way of handling their fear and their illness a little bit. Right. And yeah, so I didn't know because I knew, I felt like you worked with like prison patients for like a brief time, didn't you? So I yeah. didn't know if any of them ever came in like for surgery with like swastika tattoos. I mean, that's probably made mainly like a TV show plot line, but it could have, it could have happened to you. I didn't know. Although, you know, we, not so we talked about it on, on one of our Instagram posts because it was just 9-11. We, we did when I was a resident, I, I told the whole story, check it out on one of our most recent Instagram posts, uh, one of our story times that I took care of a couple of terrorists who were planning to bomb the world trade center you know, that earlier, there was that earlier bombing that that didn't go off well, where they drove that truck under the World Trade Center, a car or van. Then shortly thereafter, there were these cells, you know, terrorist cells that were picked up and found and brought. And I wound up having to take care of these guys. Luckily, they were unconscious most of the time. Uh, but but we didn't really have any any interaction. And, and the truth is, we were just trying to take care of them. Apparently. This former doctor, the writer Adam K, I mean, he used to write in his diary. So I guess this is all coming from some real place. Yeah. Uh, it's like he he was only a doctor from 2004 to 2009. And then I guess he just had a bad experience and couldn't couldn't take it anymore. Which the show, I think the show does make me think, why would anyone do this? It just seems like so miserable, like working in that health system. And I, I don't know, all, all that you have to take on. But then the character... Um, watches a consultant drive by in a fancy car and he's telling his boyfriend that's why you know he'll be him in a few years just a few more years so obviously this character wants to make money and uh, move up right but the the other thing that we see about him is he's a good doctor you know and yeah. uh and and i and i think you know there's an element of him liking it I think so too. I mean he's supposed to be at a bachelor party he can't he has to leave because he has to take another shift like you know, common tropes. They can't, they can't be a friend. They can't like have a family. Like they're just too busy, but the guy's bachelor party that it's supposed to be, he's, he just tells him you would rather be at the hospital. So maybe some part of him, even though he looks miserable, just really likes it. But the truth is he would rather have been at the hospital than at that bachelor party. He he (laughs) did not want to be at that bachelor party. So I think, you know, at least for that, it was, you know, for that scene, for that particular thing, I think, he did not want to be at that bachelor party. So I think he was kind of like happy to have to go off a little bit. It wasn't like something he necessarily wanted to be at other than being there with his boyfriend. Right. And then I think so future episodes, like I want to finish the show. So supposedly the future episodes follow the intern, the girl that he thought just started, but she was like, I've been here for two months. And he was like, stop being a wallflower. You have to start doing stuff. People step on wallflowers. So he kind of gives her some shit just to like encourage her to do better. And so I think future episodes have her breaking the fourth wall and telling her experience as like an intern. Oh, I, I haven't seen that yet, but that's that sounds cool. I like that. The other thing, though, I mean, there there is totally that element of having trouble being able to please everybody. And in fact, I was talking to my kid about it yesterday. 
who we, we went on a hike, which, which was great. And um, she was, we were talking about the balance of work and home. And I, you know, and I started this private practice that I'm in. And I said to her, you know, it's kind of like I have two marriages and my wife is at work and my wife's at home. You know, my fam- both my families want me there all the time. And both of them are unhappy if I'm not there all the time. And there's this ongoing stress for me and battle to, and it's not who I'm going to please, it's who I'm going to choose to make unhappy a little bit at me. And it's really an ongoing battle because, uh, you know, unfortunately, it's not, with most parts of medicine, it's not shift work. It, it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, I, I'm, it's, it's not, although some parts of medicine are, it, you know, you could be a dermatologist, you could be an emergency medicine doctor, uh, but at least the training is kind of brutal to get there either way. I feel like from all the specialties we've talked to, the dermatologists seem to be the most carefree. I would yeah, say. They, yeah, they have the dermatologists definitely have the best quality of life, I think. But emergency medicine docs do too. They have a lot of high stress when they're working, but it really is shift work and they don't take their work home with them. You know, they they turn it off and and there's no reason to have to worry about a patient again unless you're worried about a patient on your own. But uh, and then when you're off, you're off and, and you could kind of book your shifts and, and plan a life a little bit. And, and as we talk to a lot of ER docs, a lot of them have second careers or big, amazing hobbies that they're able to really concentrate on. That's true. We talked to an ER doc who also started her own medical cannabis uh, business. And that's one. Yeah. Dr. Sherry Afai. Yeah. And, and she's busy doing both. Right. Um, then my other question was, so I feel like you briefly kind of talked about a patient you helped. I don't know if it was in France or somewhere, but my question is, have you ever worked in like the European health system? Have you ever worked in, I know you did work in Africa as like when you were coming up, but have you ever worked anywhere else as like a surgeon? No, only in Ecuador and in, but all like on medical missions in Africa and Ecuador, uh, a couple of times in Africa, but but never, uh, never, never in Europe at all. And how, like, would it be hard for you to become a doctor if you moved to Europe? Or is it like an easy? So I, I think you have to go through, you know, all the certifications again. You, leaving a country going anywhere, I think is very challenging, unless you're going kind of to a third world place where they're just in such dire need. Right. But I think otherwise it's, it's pretty challenging. And, and, you know, even though everybody says, oh, you need doctors everywhere, you really have to start from scratch if you're going somewhere else, you know, to another part of the world. Right. Okay. I was just curious because the, I mean, it's, it seems, it seems crazier than Cedar sinai but who knows? Who knows? Like the national health service that they have in Europe. Right. That seems more like how I trained back in the day at, in Brooklyn at, at State University of New York at, at, in Brooklyn at Downstate because we, that's where we went to Kings County. That's where we, so it was at a big county hospital. That's where I went to the prison ward. There was a whole tuberculosis ward. There was this insane psychiatric building that was pretty frightening to go to. So I, I, I think I had a pretty similar kind of experience that, that that guy had. And, and it was brutal, but it was, but for me, I wasn't, for me, it was kind of fun. Okay. Well, yeah. yeah. So I, even though I felt like it was showed a lot of miserable parts of being a, a doctor in the NHS, I, I want to continue watching. I think it's interesting. Yeah. That, that's why I kept watching that other episode. I kind of wanted to, I wanted to see the progression a little bit and kind of get a sense of things. And not only that, it makes me very interested in, in the Adam K, the guy himself. Like I, I want to know more about him a little bit. Right. I think he just, we've, I mean, we've talked about doctors before just becoming writers. So I think that's what he's going to do from now on. And he's also, he's married to um, a guy that was an executive producer on Game of Thrones. I think he's involved in the prequel. So they're probably just very creative minds working together, married. Oh, wow. That's really cool. Are you watching the prequel? What is it called? House of Dragon? No, the House of... Something like that. Everyone just calls it Game of Thrones. Right. Um, it might be called House of the Dragon, but 
uh, I watched the first episode and then I just, I don't know. I'm just not ready for it. I don't think we're watching it. You are. Is it, does it get better? It's entertaining. It's not game of Thrones. Yeah. I mean, so yeah, the first one, I just found myself like looking down at the floor. I was like, Oh, maybe I'm not ready for all this blood and guts yet. I don't know. Uh-oh. Oh, that didn't bother me. I just think Game of Thrones hit struck lightning and and this hasn't. And the only reason this is worth watching is because it's Game of Thrones ish. Right. Well, I mean, yeah. And I guess that was a problem, too. There's just like so many characters. I was like, am I ready to get in all of this again? I'm like, I don't know who they're talking about. Do I even care about them if their name's not Jon Snow? I don't know. But I'm sure eventually I'll I'll watch the rest of it. Yeah, I think it's worth watching if you're a big Game of Thrones fan. Right. I did start the Rings of Power, the Lord of the Rings. That that definitely took a while to get into it. It's very slow. I don't I don't think I'm gonna be watching that. It's uh if you need something to go to sleep to, it's good. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, all right. Good to know. But that's all I'm watching. Um anything else you want to share with the audience? Just that I'm I'm reading an interesting book. I already talked about it on, on the Instagram post too, called The New New Thing. Here you go. We could maybe even snap a shot of it. So I'm reading this book. I'm almost done with it uh, by Michael Lewis about the guy who founded uh, about Jim Clark, who founded the company Netscape and made a gazillion dollars, you know, the Internet thing. But then he started this company Healthion, which was supposed to revolutionize medicine that eventually got bought by WebMD. Everybody knows WebMD, but it's just an interesting story as well. And there is our new dog, Simon. Do You see Simon over there? Simon. <laughs> Here's Simon. And there's Simon. <laughs> He's so cute. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. So it's an interesting book, uh, just in terms of the fact that he got into the healthcare business and made a billion dollars. And and uh I hate him also. <laughs> <laughs> These people are so yeah, smart. Uh I just yeah. Well, Adam K said, I guess his dad was a doctor, so he felt like he had to go to medical school. So maybe he always wanted to be a writer, but still to be able to do both is very impressive. Yes, I agree. All right. Well, is that thanks for joining us at Gross Anatomy? Yeah, thanks for joining us at Gross Anatomy, everyone. Where we explore the sights, smells, and sounds of medicine, how it relates to pop culture, movies, TV, books, podcasts, and the world around us. And Lauren Taylor in the East Coast. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. That's it for this week. Thanks for listening to Gross Anatomy and be sure to subscribe to our podcast so you can check out more episodes on the evolving sights, smells, and sounds of medicine. Gross Anatomy is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition.